as many of you know, um, I spent the last few years of my time at MSL before I retired, um, trying to find a way to get uh, some metrology ideas into some of the science courses at local universities. And um, you get the first slide. <laughs> there we go. Um, not with a lot of success, it has to be said. And over much the same period, the MSA has been trying to get uh, metrology ideas into uh, the measurement parts of practically all levels of education. And um, an opportunity was presented to us uh, late last year um, when we found out that Melanie Oi at, uh, she's the professor of electrical engineering at Waikato University, is in the process of revising the entire curriculum for the electrical engineering school there. And she wanted a fourth year paper on instrumentation and measurement. And after a bit of toing and froing um, and support from the MSA, uh, the agreement was that I would produce 12 lectures for the measurement half of this measurement and instrumentation paper. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, before I get underway, though, there's a huge bunch of people I need to thank for this. Um, some of the ideas that are included in there, most of the ideas are included in there, it has to be said, are distilled from interactions I've had with colleagues here. Um, and overseas at uh, other national measurement institutes and people I've worked with in industry and so on. So there's a, there's a lot, of, lot of people I really ought to thank in person, but there's a few that I will identify. Uh, my old boss, John Nicholas, who first got me interested in measurement theory. Uh, colleagues here, particularly Keith Jones, Blair, uh, Peter Saunders. Uh, there's ideas there from Eleanor Howick. Um, Rob Willink, um, there's a lot of people here. This, this is all distilled down from essentially my experience over 40 years. Okay, what I'm gonna cover is really some background to the idea. Um, what I think the problem is with metrology, um, some of the consequences of that problem, and then we'll look a little bit at the 12 lectures themselves, and then I'll, briefly outline uh, my hopes for the future. The problem that metrology faces is that it uh, doesn't have a formal system for teaching. Um, the technical word for this is a pedagogy. Um, if you look at the other sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, um, the universities have been teaching these topics for decades and have built up systems of measurement, ways of thinking about chemistry or physics or biology in such a way that it's systematic. And one thing, one idea follows from the other. It's all a nice coherent whole, largely. That's lacking for metrology. And in fact, the way we tend to learn metrology is a master-apprentice relationship. And that means that what we learn depends on our mentor, it depends on the measurement discipline we're working in, and it depends on the specific problems we work at over however many years we are a metrologist. And that means that we have a very, very individualistic idea of what metrology is. Um, sometimes that's a peculiar idea that'd be quite idiosyncratic, but there are always gaps. And no one, nearly no one, there are very few people that seem to step back and think about the big picture. What is metrology really? And uh, hopefully um, these 12 lectures will sow a seed that people can build on and uh, develop a, some sort of uh, pedagogy for science, uh, for metrology. Now, one of the consequences of a lack of a pedagogy for metrology is that there's no clear unifying principles. Um, the thermometry group that I was a part of had very little contact with electrical standards, apart from the fact we got them to calibrate stuff. They had very little contact with balances and weighing or photometry and radiometry. We've got all these isolated groups of people working in their own little master apprenticeship relationships, and there's no real coherent whole about this, no unifying principles. Uh, so what do I have in mind? Well, if you look at biology, 
uh, Darwin's theorem of theory of evolution tends to unite everything. Everything in biology tends to hang off it and not much in biology makes much sense without it. It is the single unifying principle that ties biology together. If you look in physics, uh, Nernst's theorem uh, ties much of physics together. Now, probably a lot of you don't know about Nernst's theorem. Emmy Nernst was a, a mathematician working in the early 1900s. Uh, who made several major contributions to mathematics, but one of the most significant ones she made was recognizing the connection between symmetry and conservation laws. So for example, as a physicist, I'd like to think that if I conduct an experiment on such and such a date under certain conditions, mm -hmm. that if I repeat that experiment at a different time under exactly the same conditions, that I get the same answer. And it turns out that that requirement, that symmetry in time is equivalent to a conservation of energy. And what you find is that all these other conservation laws in physics come about from uh, similar, 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 similar symmetry arrangements, requirements, uh, if you like, that the universe is consistent and behaves well. So most of physics depends on those conservation laws, which in turn depend on these requirements. So what might a, a unifying principle for measurement look like? And Blair alluded, it, alluded to it earlier, what I think is a really good starting point is the connection between measurements and decision-making. Every measurement we make is used to help someone make a decision. And if we make that connection, then a lot of the other things that we do in metrology, the need for physical standards, communicating units, uh, concepts of traceability, the fact that when we make those decisions, we might make mistakes. So we need to manage the risks and costs of those decisions. So we need uncertainty of measurement. All of these things that come about simply from that link between measurements and decision making. So I think that's a good starting point for our science anyway. There are a few other symptoms. Um, is it I think a relatively poor understanding of measurement uncertainty in our community, um, despite the fact that it is probably the one universal amongst all our measurement disciplines, despite the fact that it's probably the most published topic in our journals, despite the fact that BIPM has committees working on it, um, it is still problematic. And I'll give you an example. Um, when I went to school in a chemistry class, I can recall asking, um, a chemistry teacher, why is it that we have to calculate the measurement uncertainty? And the response was, because it's a measure of the quality of the measurement. Now that's true enough, but it's not telling me why I need it. And until we know why, till we know the purpose, we can never figure out whether what we do with uncertainty is actually fit for purpose. And yet despite, you know, in intervening 40 years, you still see the same statement repeated in BIPM documents. There's still no clear statement of why they need uncertainty. So I think that's problematic. Um, people have already alluded to the problems with measurement scales. Um, that again, turns up right throughout metrology. Um, metrologists as, um, you know, the people who work in measurement standards laboratories, for example, tend to focus all of their work on one particular type of scale. So they're not immediately familiar with these other scale types. That, and when they're confronted with them, they often make mistakes. And some of these mistakes you can see in the public domain as well. This is a classic uh, where you've got a weather reporter here who says that temperature in Darwin is twice that is of Perth. Now, when we see that, we might think there's something wrong with that but how many have actually know why that's wrong? Not very many. And in fact, you can see very, very similar mistakes even in the SI brochure produced by the BIPM. So this is, this is a problem that diffuses right through the whole of metrology as well. Um, metrologists like to think of themselves as um, you know, practicing measurement science. Well, in fact, they only practice in a very, very small corner of measurement science. And the moment they confront with some of the stuff that doesn't conform to their expectations, we tend to get into trouble. But this is, in fact, these areas are where most of industry uh, works. 
Another example of that is a poor understanding of the nature of measurements. Um, I can recall over the years, uh, long discussions over morning tea about why is it that we don't have documentary standards for calibrations? Another question I've heard over morning tea is, why is it that the test labs don't have to do uncertainty analyses? And it turns out that those two questions are the, are the opposite face of, a, of the same problem. There are a large bunch of measurements for which we have good, clean mathematical models. That's what we as metrologists are used to dealing with. But most of industry work with measurements of things like octane rating, metal hardness, and what have you, where there is no clear definition. There is no basis in science for any of those things. They are, they are defined by procedure. So you cannot build a model, you cannot do an uncertainty analysis. And again, we're starting to see the uh, experts at the BIPM starting to venture into areas where we are dealing with these operational measurements and they're causing problems. So it's, it's an important distinction that I think every metrologist should know about. Probably the most telling, um, I'm gonna ask a question when we finish this. When I finished uh, university, I had never heard of PEL. I knew very little about the SI system. I didn't know anything about accreditation. I didn't know how documentary standards affect measurements. And I'd never heard of legal metrology. How many, how many other people were in a similar boat? Okay, given that we leave university to work in a job where we spend most of our lives doing measurements, I think that's shocking. It's appalling that most of our graduates just don't know anything about the measurement infrastructure in their country when they leave. So that's something we want to, need, want to fix as well. Okay, so what's the fix? Somehow I think we've got to get metrology into the universities. Now, one of the reasons I failed for so long was that the universities are extremely time poor. You talk to them, oh yes, that's a really good idea. Nothing else. Um, they just don't have the time to think about it, let alone do the years of research that's required to put together a set of lectures on a subject that they're unfamiliar with. Uh, so if this is going to happen, it's down to us. We've got to get together, we've got to work together and build a teaching resource that the universities can draw on. Now, um, we're very grateful for the fact that the MSA is leading this initiative. Waikato University is prepared to trial the lectures for us. Um, so I'm hopeful that this will continue. And then as more and more people contribute to it, they revise the notes that I've prepared, they expand, adapt, add bits and pieces that are obvious gaps. I'm, I'm just as idiosyncratic as any other metrologist. There will be gaps, there will be things that I've got wrong. People are going to have to build on top of this. So what's in the lectures? Um, I'll come to that shortly perhaps. The, the aim is essentially to help students develop a sufficient understanding of metrology to enable them to make and recognize high quality measurements, to interact appropriately with other professional users of measurements, and to recognize and interact with the key elements of their national quality infrastructure. So that's the aim. Um, I should point out that the lectures are not intended to replace all the discipline specific courses that the various NMIs give out. We have at MSL, for example, uh, temperature balances and weighing, photometry, radiometry courses. This is not intended to replace those, at least my notes aren't, maybe that'll happen in the future. Um, but they're there to provide an overview of metrology that um, is really beyond the scope of these other co uh, discipline specific courses. Now, these are the contents of the lectures. Uh, you can see there are 12 lectures. Uh, the first four are on the nature of measurement. Um, the first one is really just an introduction that um, opens people's eyes to just how complicated measurements can get when you start involving other people. Uh, there's a lesson on measurement scales. Uh, we talk about representational measurements. These are the ones where you do have mathematical models and can do uncertainty analyses and so on. We also talk about operational measurements. These are the ones where the measure ends are defined by procedure. 
Um, there's a large block of lessons on measurement uncertainty, uh, including one that focuses just on its purpose. Uh, and then finally, the three lectures on measurement quality. So we start at, um, if you like, the inside of it, building technical procedures. Then we talk about in the environment in which those procedures are carried out within an organization. So that's quality systems and accreditation. And then we talk about the national quality infrastructure. Okay, so progress so far. Um, the lectures were completed in February of this year, so not that long ago. Um, the course is currently being taught at Waikato. Uh, I believe they're up to about lecture nine or 10. Um, and the intention is for MSA to curate these and promote them to other tertiary institutions. Um, so I guess if people want to contribute, um, the, the approach should be to the MSA, particularly Ann Evans. Where next? Um, I'm guessing that once the university has completed this run through the courses, they're going to have um, a long list of things that they found difficult or problematic, which we're going to have to address. So there'll be um, revisions required. Um, I know there are topics that I've missed. Um, I would like to see them included. So I might twist a few arms and see people have volunteered to include them. Um, and in particular, I would like to see probably a couple of hundred examples amongst the exercises and examples in the lectures that people can draw on. And that's got to, they've got to be drawn from, you know, every measurement discipline if we can manage it. And finally, it's got to be promoted to uh, MSA members and to educational institutes. There's a possibility, uh, Anne has talked about of getting these lectures on the MSA website so that members can work through them themselves. Okay. Thank you.